The Italian astronomer Galileo once wrote that the great book of the universe stands continually open to our gaze. But it cannot be understood unless one first learns to comprehend the language in which it is written. Throughout the centuries, we have turned our eyes to the heavens in an effort to fathom their complexity, meaning, and design. It is a timeless quest for discovery, and today it is enhanced by the most sophisticated instruments ever devised. Amazing tools of astronomy that draw the deepest regions of space into clearer focus than at any time in history. Unfolding before our eyes, a vast frontier of seemingly infinite wonder and size. During the next few moments, we will continue our search to understand both the mysteries of the universe and our significance within it, as we venture to the most distant corners of creation. And as we pause along the way to marvel at the celestial masterpiece the Creator has fashioned in the night sky, we will stand in a light more radiant than cast by any galaxy or star the light of God's eternal power and truth, reflected in the miracle of all that He has made. In all of history, this has to be the greatest time ever to be an astronomer, because the pace of discovery just keeps accelerating. The answers to so many questions we could have only dreamed of knowing in the past now actually seem within our reach. It's a tremendous challenge, because once you leave the solar system and head out into the realm of deep space, the concepts of distance, time, and quantity take on meanings that are almost impossible to grasp, at least in the context of everyday experience. You see, within our sun's family of planets, we can usually count and measure using increments that are somewhat familiar. Thousands, millions, perhaps billions. But when you consider the universe as a whole, it's so large that you have to begin thinking in trillions, and then from there move on to numerical values that are even more inconceivable. And even amongst astronomers, we throw around these huge numbers as if we really understand them. Oftentimes, I'm not convinced we really do. I have to sit back from time to time and reflect upon what are these millions and billions and trillions and much bigger numbers that we throw around so easily. Now, to work with numbers that large requires a special unit of measurement. So astronomers have devised the light year. Simply put, it's the distance that light travels in 365 days. Think of it this way. We know that a beam of light moves at 186,000 miles per second. So in the course of a year, it'll travel about 6 trillion miles. At that rate, you could make a complete trip around the Earth in the length of time it takes to snap your fingers. Traveling that rapidly, a trip to the moon would take 1.3 seconds. You could reach the sun in about 8 minutes. And the nearest star outside the solar system, Alpha Centauri, would require a journey of a little over four years. Now once you've established in your mind what a light year is, and again it's the distance that light travels in 365 days, then you begin to realize what a hundred light years must mean, or a thousand light years, or a hundred thousand light years. And uh, you would lose that entirely if you talked about miles in every one of those cases.
Now, despite the enormous distances involved, technology has opened a spectacular window to the universe. And as we continually venture out, sometimes millions of light years from the Earth, we not only see many of creation's greatest wonders, we also have the chance to come face to face with the full magnitude of God's power. And it's an awesome sight. Though its dimensions are enormous, our solar system actually measures about one one-thousandth of a single light year in diameter and is, in reality, only a pinpoint on one arm of the Milky Way galaxy. A cosmic ocean of perhaps 200 billion stars. To better understand just how large our galaxy really is, Imagine the orbital pathways of the planets, compressed into an area the size of a coffee cup. Within the parameters of this dramatically reduced scale, the Milky Way would still engulf the entire North American continent. Our solar system is located here, on the outskirts of the galaxy, about 25,000 light years from its center. If we were to view the Milky Way on its edge, it would appear much like this. Its flat disk, measuring about 100 million light years across, surrounds its bulging central core, a brilliantly luminous region containing more than 100 billion stars. Branching from this radiant hub, majestic arms comprised of gas, dust, and stars rotate like a carousel at speeds that can exceed 9,000 miles a minute. These arms are among the most beautiful of God's creations. And the location of mysterious and wondrous phenomena we are only beginning to understand. Scattered throughout the Milky Way, magnificent regions called nebulae move among the stars. These islands of hydrogen gas and dust, many of them thousands of times larger than our entire solar system, are illuminated by starlight, creating the most vibrant colors in the universe. Some of these nebulae, including the breathtaking Eagle, may possibly be stellar nurseries, locations where new stars are born. While others, like the Crab Nebula, are the products of an event that, though rarely observed, has captivated astronomers for centuries. In July of 1054 AD, Chinese astronomers first viewed and recorded the appearance of a spectacular new celestial body. They called it a guest star, and for 23 days it blazed as the brightest object in the heavens, except for the sun. Though they didn't realize it at the time, those ancient observers were witnesses to the violent death of a star more than 6,500 light years away.
now known as a supernova, the exploding star hurled gas, dust, and heavy elements in every direction while forming the ever-expanding nebula. Until 1968, an aura of mystery surrounded the cloud-like mass. Astronomers could not understand why, after 900 years, the remains of a dead star could continue to shine so brightly. Finally, the answer was uncovered at the National Radio Observatory in Green Bank, West Virginia. After aiming a powerful astronomical instrument at the center of the Crab Nebula, then tracking it as it moved through the heavens, radio frequencies not visible to optical telescopes were detected pulsing in a precise, consistent pattern. The source of these unusual transmissions would prove to be one of the most fascinating celestial bodies ever discovered. Following the explosion that had formed the nebula, remnants from the dead star compressed into a small, extremely dense object called a pulsar. Measuring less than 20 miles in diameter, the pulsar spun rapidly on its axis while generating an invisible shaft of ultraviolet energy that swept through space much like the beam from a lighthouse. These constant bursts of radiation have heated and illuminated the Crab Nebula for nearly a thousand years. Shortly after its discovery, this sequence of photographs provided a direct view of the pulsar flashing within the great cloud of gas and dust. Since 1968, radio telescopes have identified several hundred of these mysterious remnants of once massive stars throughout the Milky Way. The death of a star can produce another, even stranger phenomenon. When a star at least five times the size of the sun finally burns out its fuel supply, it can collapse on itself, forming a black hole. The gravitational pull of this galactic whirlpool is so strong that everything around it, including light itself, is trapped inside. The shape of a star is distorted and stretched while being relentlessly consumed by the inescapable forces of a neighboring black hole. It has been speculated that the center of the Milky Way may contain a black hole with a mass and gravitational pull millions of times greater than our own sun. Less than a century ago, it was commonly believed that the Milky Way was, in and of itself, the entire universe. Nothing was thought to exist beyond its boundaries. Then, in 1924, high above Los Angeles at the Mount Wilson Observatory, a discovery was made that would dramatically alter the world's perception of the cosmos. Utilizing the most powerful telescope of his day, the astronomer Edwin Hubble conclusively determined that distant hazy objects in space, long thought to be nebulae within the Milky Way, were in reality individual galaxies, many as large or larger than our own. For the first time in history, 
a correct conceptual view of the universe was in sight. Edwin Hubble had opened a window to a cosmos inconceivably large and filled with countless galaxies, richly diverse in their sizes and shapes. Elegant spirals, similar to the Milky Way, were discovered throughout the heavens. The graceful arms of these flat galactic pinwheels are formed of gas, dust, and billions of stars. Even more common are elliptical galaxies. Virtually devoid of gas, ellipticals are comprised almost exclusively of stars alone and are usually spherical or oblong in shape. while smaller, irregular galaxies take on a variety of eccentric forms. About 2% of all known galaxies are classified as irregular. Many of them are satellites of more massive spirals and ellipticals. Once thought to be evenly distributed throughout the universe, we now realize that individual galaxies are instead drawn together, at least in part by gravitational attraction, to form clusters and chains. It has been said that a penny held at arm's length toward the constellation Coma Berenices will block from view a cluster of more than a thousand galaxies. Important clues to understanding the overall structure of the entire universe may well reside in these galactic clusters. And as astronomers continue to survey and map every corner of the cosmos, a remarkable tool of observation revolutionizes their quest for discovery. The orbiting Hubble Space Telescope. Named in honor of the renowned astronomer, the Hubble telescope captured the attention of the world during its spectacular repair mission in December of 1993. Tally-ho on Hubble there, uh, Houston. Houston, Endeavor has a firm handshake with Mr. Hubble's telescope. A team of astronauts aboard the space shuttle Endeavor adjusted and fine-tuned the complex instrument while improving the focusing ability of its optical systems. Since then, the orbiting telescope has more than fulfilled the dreams of astronomers throughout the world. Working 300 miles above the haze of our planet's atmosphere, the telescope relies on the predictability and order of the universe to achieve its objectives. When a target area is identified in space, the Hubble's computers lock in on two of a possible 15 million predetermined guide stars. This procedure accurately aligns and maintains the position of the instrument as it continually moves around the Earth.
The superb clarity and detail of the Hubble photographs have already established the telescope as one of the most significant astronomical tools of all time, reshaping our view of virtually every aspect of the cosmos. Hubble images of the M100 galaxy, 56 million light years from the Earth, are enabling astronomers to accurately measure distances to stars that could provide vital clues toward computing the true size of the universe. The volatile star Eta Carina. Scientists now have a clear picture of a colossal eruption that ejected fragments of the star far into space at speeds exceeding two million miles an hour. With its cameras aimed at the nucleus of M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy, this photograph of a mysterious silhouette on the galactic core is believed to be a direct glimpse of a massive black hole. After staring for 10 days at a small patch of sky near the handle of the Big Dipper, the Hubble generated one of the most spectacular pictures in the history of science. at least 1,500 galaxies, many only one four billionth as bright as the dimmest light the human eye can see, were revealed in a single breathtaking panorama. Within a pinpoint of sky, the size of the area blocked by a grain of sand held at arm's length, the scope of galactic diversity and distribution was showcased as never before. At the very limits of the known universe, the Hubble telescope has photographed small, extremely bright galaxies that release incredible amounts of radiation. Quasi-stellar radio sources, or quasars. These distant objects, some a thousand times brighter than the Milky Way, emit as much energy every second as our sun could radiate in 10 million years. The source of a quasar's power is still unknown, but a popular theory contends there is an enormous black hole in its nucleus. The quasar's gravitational field is strong enough to attract a neighboring galaxy, and in the process, it pulls off huge quantities of stars and gas. As the galaxies merge, the quasar converts its captured fuel supply into radiation strong enough to blaze from the deepest corners of known space.
From the vantage point of a mountaintop observatory, the heavens are an open volume waiting to be read. And as a sky filled with individual wonders is surveyed each night, no aspect of the universe proves more striking to behold than its size. Throughout the Old Testament, a recurring phrase is used to describe God's shaping of the cosmos. He stretched out the heavens. Though written more than 3,000 years ago, the words convey a vivid and accurate picture of the universe modern astronomy continues to reveal. The sheer quantity of celestial bodies is almost beyond comprehension. Though estimates continue to rise, it is believed there are at least 100 billion individual galaxies in the universe, many of them comprised of 200 billion stars or more. In an effort to draw these numbers into some kind of meaningful focus, the British astronomer Sir James Jeans speculated that the total number of stars in space could equal or surpass the total number of grains of sand on all the seashores of all the world. And in most cases, each of these stars is separated from any other by trillions of miles. He stretched out the heavens indeed. But how large really is the universe? There is no way to measure precisely, but some perspective can be drawn by using the imagination to survey its boundaries of distance and time. Let us travel now at the speed of light, departing from our home star on a trip across the cosmos toward the edge of the known universe. Our imaginary journey begins at midnight on January 1st, when we prepare to launch into space at the speed of 186,000 miles per second. We quickly pass the orbits of Mercury, Venus, and span the 93 million miles that separate the Earth from the Sun in just eight minutes, 19 seconds. We continue on, passing Mars. Then the gas giant planets, Jupiter. Saturn. Uranus. Neptune. Finally, after five hours and 31 minutes, we race past Pluto and its companion moon. Our journey has taken us more than three and a half billion miles to the outer limits of our solar system. And it's still January 1st. Now we alter our flight path and travel in a direction perpendicular to our galaxy. Behind us, the nine planets and the sun quickly vanish from sight. The emptiness of space is broken only by the light of stars so distant they do not yet appear to move. A year passes, then two years, three, four years, Finally, on April 19th of the fifth year, we reach Alpha Centauri, the nearest star to our solar system. We have traveled more than 25 trillion miles, and our journey has scarcely begun. We are now 10 light years from the sun, far enough out in space that the stars within our galaxy appear to converge. 
100 light years from the sun. Patterns of gas and nebulous material from the arms of the Milky Way fill our view. 1,000 light years. The galaxy's arms and disk become more defined. Yet it is not until we have traveled at the speed of light for 100,000 years that the entire spiral shape of the Milky Way is recognizable. From here on, each point of light we see is no longer an individual star, but an entire galaxy composed of billions of stars. Five million years after beginning our journey, the Milky Way is seen as part of a cluster of about 30 galaxies, known as the local group. Fifty million light years out, we encounter the large Virgo cluster, containing more than 2,000 galaxies. And so it goes, as our travels continue to take us deeper into the cosmos. We pass cluster after galactic cluster, each a building block of a far greater framework. A billion years pass. Five billion. Finally, after 10 billion years, we decelerate and pause to observe a theoretical view of the universe's large-scale structure. Countless billions of galaxies are now seen to comprise chains, masses, and thread-like structures that stretch across the cosmos, separated by enormous regions of empty space. It is a spectacular tapestry, so vast and diverse in its design, that the power of its creator must truly surpass all human understanding. From the perspective of size alone, I guess that you could say as human beings, we appear to be little more than microbes, living on a speck of cosmic dust we call the Earth. Here we have a universe that's so incredibly large, and we are incredibly small, so that relatively speaking, our place in the universe is totally insignificant. This was illustrated by the Voyager spacecraft several years ago. Millions of miles from Earth, Voyager 1 looked back and showed us our planet in a way we had never seen it before. It was just a tiny dot engulfed by a single ray of sunlight. And when you look at the picture today, it's not hard to understand how the Old Testament writer David must have felt when he asked God, how could man possibly be important to you? It is a question both timeless and quite logical. 
For when considered against the inconceivable power and size displayed throughout the universe, any perceptions of personal importance we may hold are easily overwhelmed. Yet God did not create on this awesome scale to frighten or intimidate us with His power. Instead, each night He uses the sheer magnitude of the cosmos to help reveal the enormous significance of every human life. Uh, we're told in the, uh, in the book of Psalms, in the Old Testament, again of the Bible, that the heavens declare the glory, glory of God. We're not told anywhere else that uh, any other part of nature specifically does that as clearly as the heavens do. It's interesting to note that by definition, the very word cosmos means an object of superb craftsmanship or a system of order and harmony. Now that's a wonderful interpretation of exactly what the universe seems to be. God has revealed his creative uh, juices, if you will, in the way that he's, he's made diversity and beauty and wonder. And it's there getting our attention, saying, hey, I'm here, look, here's the evidence that I'm here. It's something that the Lord has put out there for each one of us to seek out and come to the conclusion that there must be a designer, there must be a creator. And so consequently, uh, I think most astronomers I've ever met uh, believe there is a God. We may differ in, in our opinions or understanding of just who God is and how involved he is with his creation, but uh, the vast majority of astronomers I do believe recognize that there is a creator. But even though I've met very few atheist astronomers, I've come to realize that merely recognizing that God exists is only the first step toward really understanding him. As we look deeper and deeper into space, the size, splendor, and design we see throughout the universe tells us very clearly that there must be a creator. Yet to understand what that creator is really like, we must employ a different tool of exploration, something that can extend our view beyond what we can learn about God from observing the physical aspects of his creation alone. It's a difficult jump to make when you're, you're going from the world of science, you're going to the world of thought, you're going to the world of physical evidence. You can test things in the laboratory or test ideas or theories. But then when you try to come down to the ultimate questions of the meaning of life and what our relationship is to God and, and what our responsibilities are, science has no answers for you there. You have to leave the realm of science and go into some other realm. Now we're talking about the spiritual realm and our methodology there has to change, our tools have to change, because there's no way that our finite minds could ever accurately discern the true nature of an infinite God. To do that, we needed something beyond our own intellect or experience. So God revealed himself to us in the form of his word, the Bible. Opening a Bible is an experience in some ways comparable to turning a telescope toward the night sky. For like a precisely crafted lens or mirror, the Bible clarifies and expands our understanding, not of planets and galaxies, but of the God who made them. Anyone who reads its pages can begin to discern the deepest feelings and thoughts of the creator of the universe. And as we look beyond the realities of his unmistakable existence and power, we come face to face with a personal, loving God who reaches out to each of us with his promises of forgiveness, hope, and eternal life. Come to me all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. For I am the Lord your God who says, Do not fear, for I am with you. I will strengthen you and help you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid.
In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. I have come into the world as a light, so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. Truly I say to you, he who believes in me has eternal life. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. I have loved you with an everlasting love. God loves us and cares about us very deeply. The Bible very clearly tells us that. And the more you learn about him, the more you realize that here we have a God who's so big and so powerful that he created the universe beyond comprehension in size. But yet at the same time, we have a God that loves us so much and cares for us so much individually that he's promised to meet every need that we'll ever have. For some reason beyond my understanding, we're important to the creator of the universe, and he loves us more than anything else he's ever made. In all of creation, there can be no greater mystery or miracle. Though we inhabit a mere speck of a planet, we are the supreme focus of the Creator's attention and care. And as we explore God's celestial masterpiece during the decades to come, new discoveries will undoubtedly enhance our understanding. For we are privileged to see more clearly into space than ever before. And with every stunning glimpse, the universe will continue to reflect both the grandeur of God's creative power and the matchless significance we hold in His eyes.
We are living in what is truly a golden age of exploration. A time when extraordinary tools of astronomy gaze deeper and more clearly into space than ever before, seeking answers to questions that have endured for as long as human eyes have gazed into the night skies. Is there life on other worlds? What mysteries exist among the stars? How large is the universe? And where do we, as human beings, fit into it all? 3,000 years ago, David, the Old Testament poet, reflected upon these distant points of light and wrote that the heavens declare the glory of God with a voice that goes out into all the earth. Today, that voice and the message it bears is amplified by spectacular technology. As photographs like these, the crown jewels of astronomical study, unlock new sources of insight and wonder, revealing a creation rich in diversity and brilliant in design. Join us now on a remarkable journey of discovery. A view of our solar system and the realms of deep space as seen through the most powerful eyes in all of history. And as we venture toward the very edge of the known universe, perhaps we will come to understand the supreme message that the heavens proclaim to mankind. The message of God's existence and power and the ultimate significance of every human life. Of all the sciences, astronomy is probably the oldest, for humanity's search to understand the universe has continued throughout recorded history. And as countless generations have looked up into a sky filled with lights, one star has always dominated the rest. Since the day of its creation, it has turned darkness into dawn. And to the inhabitants of our planet, no object in the heavens approaches its importance. Let us then begin our exploration of the universe at the focal point of our solar system, the Sun. They are among the most awesome sights in the heavens. Luminous fountains of hydrogen and helium, sometimes leaping a hundred thousand miles into space. To the astronomer, they are known as solar prominences, the distinctive signatures of the sun's potential and power. Compared to other stars, the Sun is of average size and brightness, yet it is still a creation of amazing proportions. 
860,000 miles in diameter. This fiery ball contains more than 99% of all the matter in the solar system. If it was hollow, a million spheres the size of the Earth could easily fit inside. Sometimes described as an immense power plant, the Sun is driven by a 10 billion year supply of fuel. Deep within its core, a nuclear reaction converts hydrogen into helium, releasing as byproducts most of the heat and light available throughout the solar system. This process is so efficient that each second the Sun emits more energy than humanity has consumed in all of history. Once believed by ancient astronomers to be a smooth, polished sphere, the Sun is actually a cauldron seething with constant change. Unlike the solid Earth, which rotates uniformly on its axis, this gigantic ball of gas spins faster at its equator than it does at its poles, causing its surface to twist and stretch violently. The products of this turmoil are dramatic. Enormous sunspots, breaks in the star's surface as large as the Earth, appear and vanish during mysterious 11-year intervals. Raging flares, the greatest explosions in the solar system often erupting with more force than a billion hydrogen bombs. And a powerful solar wind, blowing a steady stream of electrically charged particles to the most distant planets. Each second, about five million tons of the sun's mass escapes into space as pure energy. That's an amount equal to the total weight of water flowing over Niagara Falls every 10 minutes. Yet despite this tremendous loss of unreplenished matter, the sun is so large it could continue to shine at the center of the solar system for at least the next five billion years. Nothing is more admirable than the planet's motions, nothing more beautiful, and there is nothing which testifies more evidently to the wisdom of the Creator. 400 years ago, the German astronomer Johannes Kepler discovered the basic laws that govern the motions of the planets as they raced around the sun. Kepler realized that the solar system operated like a superbly crafted machine, with every gear working in harmony. We now know it is the sun's gravitational pull that drives this celestial mechanism, controlling the pathways of the nine planets. If left to follow its own momentum, each planetary body would continually move through space in a straight line, the Sun's gravity counterbalances this runaway action, first bending, then holding the course of the planets as they travel in their elliptical orbits. As with all of His creation, God had designed the Sun's family based upon order and flawless precision, where orbits were predictable to within a few seconds and miles. By understanding these movements, the roadmaps to the planets were clearly defined, and all that remained was to go.
Fueled by the timeless thirst to explore and the knowledge to navigate the depths of space, journeys, once the domain of science fiction, were launched with optimism and hope. Early destinations included Mercury, Venus, and Mars. Along with the Earth, they comprised the inner planets of the solar system. Each new glimpse of these rocky terrestrial worlds revised centuries of astronomical thought, while painting a richer, more complete picture of creation than we had ever seen before. In March of 1974, after a journey of more than 60 million miles, the spacecraft Mariner 10 made its initial encounter with Mercury. Though the planet was obscured from the Earth by the sun's blinding glare, Mariner's cameras suddenly brought it into brilliant focus. Eight thousand high-resolution photographs revealed a meteor-scarred landscape covered with impact craters. The similarities to the far side of our own moon were numerous. Devoid of any protective atmosphere, surface temperatures on Mercury range nearly a thousand degrees between the night and daylight sides of the planet. The exploration of Venus, the second planet from the Sun, would prove even more challenging. Long considered the Earth's twin because of its comparable size and proximity, about 25 million miles away, the surface of the planet was hidden by a cloud cover 150 miles thick. Utilizing radar during its three-year mission, the spacecraft Magellan effectively penetrated Venus's shroud to capture views of stunning clarity. From this data, a computer-generated flight over the terrain has helped to expand our knowledge of our nearest planetary neighbor. Venus is a forbidding yet strangely beautiful world, a realm dominated by rugged lava flows and volcanic craters. Clusters of circular lava domes and deep canyons walled by jagged cliffs create dramatic panoramas. The landscape is desolate and sterile, scorched by temperatures reaching nearly 900 degrees Fahrenheit, the highest of any planet in the solar system. For reasons still unknown, Venus rotates in a direction opposite the other planets, slowly turning east to west on its axis once every 240 Earth days. Requiring only 32 Earth weeks to orbit the Sun, a year on Venus is actually shorter than a day. After departing Venus, we approach and pass the Earth then another 50 million miles beyond our orbit, and 140 million from the Sun, looms the planet that has probably fascinated us more than any other. Mars, the fourth and last of the solid inner worlds.
For centuries, Mars had held the greatest promise for the existence of extraterrestrial life. Like the Earth, it has seasons and rotates at a rate nearly identical to our own. The Martian polar caps were known to contain large amounts of water ice. And winding channels believed to be dry riverbeds laced its surface. Decades of exploration, however, have revealed an arid, sterile world, incapable of sustaining any form of living organism. Yet despite the absence of life here, fascination with the red planet has not diminished. For studies of its geography have proven both surprising and spectacular. Only about half the diameter of the Earth, Mars is home to some of the most imposing landforms ever discovered. As we soar above its surface, canyons, craters, and volcanoes stand in awesome proportion. Valles Marineris, the largest known canyon in the solar system, stretches 2,800 miles. This sprawling rift is 13 times longer than the Grand Canyon and would span coast to coast across the continental United States. Rising 79,000 feet above the desert, Olympus Mons is the solar system's most enormous volcano. Three times taller than Mount Everest, the base of this gigantic peak would completely engulf the state of Washington. These missions to the inner planets were tremendous accomplishments. And in many ways, I think they have to rank as some of the greatest achievements in the history of astronomy. You have to remember that for thousands of years, people tried to study these planets when all they had to work with were tiny pinpoints of light in the night sky. The invention of the telescope helped, but our observations were still inconclusive. We just couldn't get close enough to see them in any detail. Then almost instantly, space probes like the Mariners and the Magellan allowed us to see these planets as we had never seen them before. Prior to the space probes, we really did not have a lot of information about the surface and the atmospheres of these planets. And then when the space probes went and sent back their pictures and other information, it was a complete revolution. Uh, whereas before we saw nothing on the surface of Venus, for instance, suddenly we saw climates, we saw atmospheres we had never been able to study before. We saw a tremendous amount of geography. And many of the ideas we had 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 to be thrown away and completely replaced with new ideas about these planets. And it happened virtually overnight. In the Old Testament of the Bible, we're encouraged to lift up our eyes to the heavens and consider the works of God. The more I think about it, I really believe that God wants us to search out every corner of his creation and try to learn all that we can about the things that he's made. This is exactly what the expeditions to the inner planets have allowed us to do. I suppose that God could have made a solar system with just one planet and one moon, but he didn't. Instead, he created something far more diverse and complex, and then he gave us the curiosity and the ability to explore it. And I believe there's a reason. I think that as our knowledge of the planets or any other part of creation increases, so does our sense of wonder for God. He's an artist, and he's painted a fascinating mural and filled it with more detail than we could ever imagine. 
and I think he wants us to experience and understand as much of it as we possibly can. That's why it's so exciting to be alive at a time when technology gives us a chance to see the universe more clearly than at any time in history. Uh, MPD, you have a go and a final clear launch. Uh, copy, launch direction, copy. Late in the summer of 1977, two remarkable journeys of exploration were launched. In many ways, they would surpass any undertaken in human history. Twin spacecraft, christened Voyager 1 and 2, escaped the Earth's gravitational pull and sped to the farthest reaches of the solar system. Their mission, to explore the giant outer planets at close range for the first time. On Earth, a global network of radio telescopes controlled the flight of the Voyager crafts. Throughout the mission, these instruments would also receive the data transmitted from space. In March of 1979, 18 months and 500 million miles after liftoff, Voyager 1 made its closest approach to its initial destination, Jupiter, the largest planet in the solar system. Jupiter is an immense sphere of hot liquid and hydrogen gas, large enough to hold a thousand Earths. It rotates on its axis completely in only 10 hours and is ringed by alternating bands of jet stream winds that travel in opposite directions. These opposing wind currents stir up clouds above the planet's surface, creating a mural of swirling abstract art. An immense hurricane, twice the size of the Earth, dominates Jupiter's surface. Discovered nearly 400 years ago, this colossal storm still rages furiously while rotating once every six days. Sixteen known moons orbit the planet. Four of them, including Europa and Io, are as large or larger than the Earth's lunar companion. Detailed photographic studies reveal worlds of diverse geography, including a system of active volcanoes on Io's surface. Before leaving Jupiter, Voyager made another discovery, a thin ring of rocky particles that encircled the giant sphere. Seen here, backlit against the sun, this previously undetected ring glows as a halo against the blackness of space. The astonishing images gathered here were only a foretaste of what was to come in the years ahead. Catapulted through space for another 18 months and 500 million miles, Voyager began its historic encounter with Saturn in the fall of 1980. About half the size of Jupiter, Saturn is the second largest planet, and its wondrous system of rings have long been the most familiar objects in the solar system. Passing within 40,000 miles, the Voyagers again sent back a wealth of information. From Earth, Saturn's rings had appeared to consist of only a few wide bands. Voyager revealed that there were actually thousands of narrow ringlets, each comprised of frozen chunks of ice mixed with dust. 
These particles ranged in size from microscopic granules to icebergs as large as a house. Saturn is orbited by at least 18 moons. Again, Voyager imagery brought them into sharper focus than ever before. Titan, the largest, is the only moon in the solar system with a significant atmosphere. While the surface of Mimas displayed an enormous meteor crater 80 miles in diameter. There is a vital relationship between Saturn and its moons, for it is the gravitational pull exerted by these tiny satellites that helps shape and define some of the planet's rings. By August of 1981, the exploration of Saturn was complete. The decision was then made to extend the mission on to Uranus and Neptune. A rare alignment of the outer planets that occurs only once every 175 years would make this grand tour of the four gas giants possible. As the Voyager 1 craft headed out of the solar system, Voyager 2 was targeted on a four-year, billion-mile course to Uranus, the seventh planet from the Sun. Again, Voyager imagery fascinated the world as its camera focused on the planet's system of rings. It found ten dark bands, the color of coal dust, ranging in width from three to sixty miles. Uranus is truly unique. Tipped over on its side, perhaps the result of an ancient meteor impact, its polar regions alternately face almost directly into the sun. The final leg of Voyager's odyssey would span yet another billion miles. A distance so great that clusters of radio telescopes were linked together to receive the spacecraft's ever weakening transmissions. And in August 1989, 12 years and three and a half billion miles after its launch, Voyager 2 approached Neptune, the last of the giant outer planets. Like Uranus, Neptune consists of a small, heavy rock core surrounded by hot liquid and topped by an atmosphere rich in hydrogen and traces of methane gas. Extensive studies of the planet's turbulent weather patterns yielded unexpected results. It now appears that Neptune is the windiest planet in the solar system. A giant rotating storm called the Great Dark Spot was photographed on its surface with violent gales reaching speeds of up to 1,500 miles per hour. A highlight of the mission was a close pass by Triton, the largest of Neptune's eight known moons. Composed of rock and ice, Triton proved to be the coldest object yet explored in the solar system. This dramatic look back at Neptune and its frozen satellite marked the end of Voyager's encounter. Its explorations of the four gas giants now complete, Voyager 2 bypassed Pluto the smallest and most distant planet, departing instead toward the boundless expanse of interstellar space.
The future of planetary exploration will ride on the wings of new dreams and the technologies they inspire. In late 1995, the spacecraft Galileo, on an extended mission to Jupiter, sent a probe beneath the planet's atmosphere for the first time and initiated a study of its four largest moons at closer range than ever before. And as we move deeper into the 21st century, even greater challenges arise, including a possible encounter with Pluto and its large moon, Charon. And an endeavor that in the past could only be labeled as science fiction. A manned mission to Mars. With each of these efforts, the timeless pursuit to understand the solar system will press forward as new knowledge is obtained. And for those who look, the heavens will continue to declare the miracle of God's glory through the beautiful and mysterious lights that orbit the sun. You know, these expeditions throughout the solar system have allowed us to make close encounters with eight planets and dozens of moons. And the diversity we've seen has been far greater than we ever expected. Through the years, space probes have generated thousands of detailed photographs, showing us planets made of rock, and others almost totally of gas. We've seen moons made largely of ice, and another with active volcanoes. No two of these worlds are exactly the same, and yet all but one of them shares a very significant characteristic. Except for the Earth, Every planet and moon that orbits the sun appears to be totally dead, completely devoid of any form of life. You know, it's possible the most important thing we've learned about the solar system is how extraordinarily special the Earth really is. The odds that life could exist here, or anywhere for that matter, are incredibly low, especially when you take into account all the finely tuned conditions and factors that have to be in place for life to work at all. Just consider the Earth's orbital pathway around the sun. The Earth moves in a narrow zone at a critical distance where survival is possible. The two planets closest to us, Venus and Mars, are either much too hot or too cold to support any kind of life. The same holds true for the other planets. It's been estimated that only 2% of the entire solar system falls within a range where temperatures are conducive to life. Fortunately, that's precisely the region we happen to occupy. Now, the fact that we're located within the ideal spot in the solar system is only one of the many reasons why we survive from day to day. You see, our moon is also 93 million miles from the sun, and yet it's as dead a place as Mars or Venus. Life on Earth is possible because many factors and properties exist and work together in combination. It's a very complicated puzzle, and our planet has all the pieces. The Earth is the only planet with liquid water. It's also the only planet with an atmosphere based upon nitrogen and oxygen. These are components absolutely essential to life. The tilt of the Earth's axis is an ideal 23 and a half degrees. When you combine that with our moderate 24-hour rotation period, it gives us seasonal changes and a temperate climate. Even the size and distance of our moon is nearly perfect. Its gravitational pull controls the daily movement of the tides so they're strong enough to cleanse the shorelines without flooding the continents. So when you start comparing these different factors, the uh, size of the planet, the distance from the sun, the tilt of the Earth's axis, the rotation period, the existence of the moon, the composition, the atmosphere, and on and on, the number of things that come together is truly remarkable. 
And uh, when you see that kind of evidence, then that suggests very strongly that it didn't just happen, but was caused to happen. Again, someone designed or planned it that way. I like to think of the Earth as a finely crafted watch. You have to have all the springs, all the levers, all the gears, and they have to be in the right place, all the right size, doing the right things. And you could take a box of watch pieces, but I don't think if you shook it up long enough, you would ever end up with a watch, and nobody would believe that you would. I believe the situation with the Earth is probably far more critical. You could take a number of different planets, a number of different sizes, distances from the sun, and try it over and over and over again randomly. And just like the watch would never come together out of those pieces, you could never get a planet to just come together with all the right factors in place at the same time to give you a suitable habitat for life. So as we've looked through the solar system, we see that the Earth is not only a unique place, but it's also a place where a number of factors have come together, working in combination, so that you have the only place suitable for life to exist. Now many people look at that and say, wow, the Earth really had a lucky break, didn't it? But I find it a lot easier to believe that instead the Earth was created that way, that there was a creator who designed it, and that when he made the world, he did so with us in mind. It's an explanation for the origin and design of the Earth that's consistent with what both science and the Word of God have revealed. And when you look throughout the solar system, it's not hard to come to the conclusion that there's truly no place like home. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And since that defining moment, our blue jewel of a planet has shined with a brilliance unique in the solar system. Its design is unparalleled. Its operation, often spectacular. And its purpose, unmatched within the boundaries of current understanding to harbor and sustain the only creation capable of exploring its wonders and knowing its God, human life.